Hi, I'm Daniel. I am also a software engineer on the uh, Linux kernel team at Meta. And today I'm going to be presenting BlazeSim, which is not really kernel related, but it has relevance for BPF and tracing in general. And so I hope it's a good conclusion to the day. What will we cover? So first I'm going to motivate uh, why we wrote BlazeSim, go a little bit more into the details of what it does. Um, provide a library overview, sort of the high-level concepts um, that we try to cover. Look into the current status. There are some gaps uh, that we know of. I want to elaborate on those. And then we look ahead uh, what's coming up and hopefully have a little bit of a discussion um, whether you see you know, also some gaps that we can close or whether you have use cases that we could cater to. So for the motivation, um, Blazem is a library that um, helps with address symbolization, among other things. So address symbolization, uh, in brief terms, is basically taking a, a raw address, a pointer, an integer, and inferring a name that is human readable, and so it helps with consumption uh, by humans. That has relevance, for instance, if you capture stack traces and you want to make sense of these. And address symbolization is uh, kind of an intricate problem um, if for, many, for many reasons, right? For first, you can use different sources for symbolization. Um, we have ELF symbols, um, relatively easy to handle. There is DWARF, which is a rather complex format. There is GSIM, there are breakpad files. Um, all of these basically require additional logic in, in your program. And let's say if you are a tool writer, right, um, just building on top of a BPF, capturing addresses and wanting to evaluate addresses and presenting them to the user in a consumable form, um, that is obviously all something that you don't necessarily want to concentrate on as a tool developer because it like takes you away from your domain of concern. There are also additional uh, system-specific details and corner cases that you would have to deal with and kind of, yeah, it gets cumbersome if everybody does that. And lastly, there are certain uh, trade-offs to be made as part of the symbolization process itself. So for instance, if you think about um, inlining functions, whether you want to consider all the possible locations where a function got inlined, um, that may require, so this information is contained, for instance, in Dwarf, but it may require additional memory um, to sort of go through all this inline information. Um, there's also an inherent trade-off between performance and memory usage, how much do you cache. Um, it would be easier, and that's kind of the proposal we are making, um, to just provide a couple of knobs that um, a developer, let's say a tooling developer, um, can adjust as opposed to having to re-implement an entire caching scheme um, in the application of interest. Um, so basically, yes, that's our proposal. We want to have a default or go-to library uh, that can be used for symbolization. And that obviously would um, take the burden of um, these low-level details of tooling developers' shoulders. Now, to give a brief overview, I already motivated um, that we want to tackle the problem of uh, symbolization itself, which is the mapping from addresses to names. Um, we are also interested in sort of going the reverse direction, um, where you map names, uh, function names, into addresses and potentially other info information. Uh, that has relevance, for instance, if you consider um, attaching a breakpoint somewhere or even considering uh, configuring a AU probe or something like that. Um, on top of that, so one consideration um, that the library has to do is we need to, or we want to handle both user space and kernel space addresses. Um, these are handled slightly differently on, on the different operating systems. And we want to make this for the most part transparent to users so that they don't have to worry about it. They don't have to use different libraries. And then obviously for these two, um, you would still use, or we would still support um, ELF and Dwarf and GSIM as backends or as sources for the actual symbolization. Uh, so these were two parts that we consider, and now the um, sort of third one is more use case driven, if you will, and that's what we consider, or what we call uh, remote symbolization. 
and basically it it just means that we split the process of symbolizing um, addresses into two parts and these two parts can essentially happen on different systems so if you normally symbolize an address uh, you would do that on a single system whereas with, with remote symbolization um, you split that and you have two two systems involved the first system can be an embedded system um, it may not even have debug information available um, what it would do is it would just capture these addresses and then it would what we refer to as normalize them basically if the address belongs to a to a process, it would look into proc PID maps um, and then spit out effectively an address that is sort of relative to the binary that it is in. And it would report this address along with um, the binary information as well as potentially some other meta information such as the build ID. This information would then be conveyed um, to the more beefier system, if you will, that would actually handle the task of symbolization itself and there on this um, I, I labeled it here fast server uh, you could have the actual dwarf data which you know may not fit onto the small embedded device at all because we we touched on this before right it can be huge potentially okay so what is the current status so we have basic support for symbolization uh, we can use uh, elf as a source meaning we can handle elf symbols that doesn't help you much if the um, binary is stripped. And so we also support dwarf as well as gsim as um, symbolization sources. Uh, a dwarf comes with an asterisk, and I will explain a little bit later where the gaps currently are. For the reverse operation, um, the lookup of um, addresses to names, uh, we currently support elf and dwarf as well. Um, other than that, we are still, so this is still um, somewhat early in the development. We are currently converging on the API surface. So we hope to have like more of a stable interface um, in the near future. Currently, we know there are still some things that we want to rename, for instance, and rearrange some parameters. But in, in large terms, I believe um, we are almost there. Uh, what I didn't mention so far is that the library is written in Rust which has implications for um, the largely C-based uh, ecosystem that is surrounding especially BPF. Um, we have, or we provide C-bindings for that purpose. Um, it basically works out of the box. Uh, we provide a auto-generated header that you can just include, and then after you build the library, meaning the Rust project effectively, um, what falls out of that is a static archive that you can link to or a shared object that you can use. Uh, we also started the integration with the meta internal profiler. Um, the goal there is to sort of get validation at large scale. So meaning, you know, a lot of the profiling within meta itself happens on large binaries. We hope there's a, a fair amount of requests happening, right? So we hope to evaluate the library and get some more confidence into it by, by running it at meta scale. We also started um, using the remote symbolization process that I outlined earlier for use on our VR headsets, meaning you have these small embedded devices, if you will, they capture the addresses of interest, and then you have a desktop system uh, that sort of symbolizes the addresses, and you can perform your analysis this way on the desktop system. I also want to thank uh, Andre for basically uh, the idea of this library, and then Kui Feng, who was involved in the first version of it. Um, I have links here to the repository as well as the documentation, but um, the slides will be uploaded, or rather they are already uploaded, and I will show the links again um, later on. Okay, so looking ahead, we know there are still a couple of gaps um, in the current version. Uh, most notably, our dwarf support is still lacking. So currently, I think it was touched on in earlier talks, uh, there are multiple dwarf versions out there, multiple dwarf standards. Currently, we only support dwarf version 4. Uh, we definitely have plans on supporting other versions as well, just for the sake of completeness, and you actually find those in, in, well, in the wild. Uh, we also currently don't support split dwarf information, uh, which is a problem 
in general that you will probably run into um, with kernels who I understand um, often rely on split dwarf information. Um, another thing we want to tackle is um, the symbolization of addresses and APKs that mostly has relevance on Android and perhaps if you follow the BPF mailing list uh, you saw me also add some uh, support for Android to the BPF itself. Lastly, well, second to last, um, we would like to have transparent support for name demangling or symbol demangling. Basically, if you're dealing with Rust, let's say, or with C++ symbols, um, they are encoded in a special way and it makes sense for the library, you know, in this batteries included fashion to actually take care of um, demangling them uh, in the process. And now truly last, we would like to support advanced use cases such as the usage of debug info D. This will likely happen as sort of a bolted on solution, more or less, and not part, be part of the core library, but um, we would really like to support that moving forward. Yeah, so that is a short overview of the library. I hope that makes sense. Um, I would like to discuss with you whether this is something that you are interested in using. Did you identify anything that uh, may be missing? Is there potentially an integration opportunity where you say, oh, look, this existing tool that I tried to work with, it only supports ELF for symbolization, let's say, and I have stripped binaries. It would be nice if you know there was an easy way to um, support other debug sources, let's say. Or is anybody working on something similar? And lastly, I mentioned that it is a Rust project. Um, we'd be interested, so we heard some, well, concerns about the consumability in that space, so we would be interested if, if you're interested in the project, um, would that pose a potential issue for you? Would it help perhaps if we provided pre-built binaries or something like that? Any I just comments? wanted to ask a quick question. <clears throat> so obviously there's a lot of benefits to Blazin beyond just performance, but have you guys compared the performance of symbolizing binaries with LLVM symbolized? Because in my experience, it's quite slow. <clears throat> Excuse me, quite slow. So even if you're just doing that, was, would there be a benefit to using Blazin just for performance? Uh, that's a good question. We have not yet compared performance, but we can do that for sure. But from like production experience, the LLVM symbolizer is like a huge memory hog. Like we, so like our profiling solution has like as a as an option uh, option to like use local symbolization with LLVM symbolizer, and we basically never use it because it just basically crashes on on like production binaries. So yeah. Uh, I, I just want to ec echo. Uh, maybe you haven't benchmarked it against the LLVM symbolizer, but it can't possibly be slower. <laughs> um, uh, I would, uh, could you elaborate on your plans uh, with debug info D? Uh, the reason I'm asking is because I'm, I'm very familiar with like the internal meta version of all of this, and uh, when I read about debug info D, I don't know, a year or two ago, I was like, this is a great place to integrate like a remote symbolication service. So, mm -hmm. is that what you're thinking? Yes. Pretty much, yes. So our initial plan, and again, I'm neither super familiar with um, debug info D, nor do we have implemented most of this uh, currently or flushed it fully out. Um, the plan was basically to kind of here in this process uh, where you symbolize uh, your addresses. Uh, you would get as input this build ID because this is part of the uh, normalization that happens on the device and we would provide sort of a user callback um, where the user would be able to do something with this build ID and potentially with um, the path and, and other metadata. And so you as a user would be able to make your, I don't know, HTTP API call um, to debug info D. Now again, when I say you as a user, it could also mean like we provide a small shim layer that on top of Blaze Sim itself that already provides this functionality for you. And then you as a true user of the this overall ecosystem uh, could use this shim layer and it would automatically just use the build ID, make a call to debug info D, pull the respective binary and does all the symbolization for you. Uh, 
just to confirm, uh, in what you're describing, is Blaze Sim running on both the slow device client and the simplication service fast server? Yes, it is. Yes. Cool. Although the way it is currently done, um, it could actually be like only half the code. Like you can literally compile out half of it, the parts that you don't need for the slow system, and you just use only the normalization logic. Great. Can you speak to, to the plans of integrating this into BPF Trace? <laughs> um, I mean Are you intending to integrate it with BPF Trace, I guess? Yes, uh. yes we do. So I think the, the current plan is that we want to get a little bit more uh, validation on Meta's infrastructure itself. And then once we have um, confidence, uh, we will speak with the BPF Trace maintainer and hopefully get it integrated there. Again, I think one of the uh, main questions will be, you know, will it be a block of the BPF trace to require a Rust toolchain, or how can we solve issues there? Did you also have a question, comment, or? Can we have a Golang library? <laughs> Just a minor point. I think last time I checked, uh, BPF Trace was u was using the BCC symbolication library to symbolize. So, like, you could just talk to myself in Yong Hong, and we'd be in favor of it. <laughs> is, sorry, what is the question? Oh, uh, you were saying, you know, uh, in response to the question about uh, replacing or improving. Uh, BPF trace symbolication with right. Blaze Sim. If I recall correctly, uh, BPF trace relies on the BCC symbolication like library stuff. So really you'd be you'd be improving the world for both BPF trace users and all the BCC tools users yep. as well. Yep, yep. I'm not sure if you mentioned that it's already integrated into one of the libbpf tools. So there is an example in BCC on how to use BlazeSim. Correct, yes. There is a um, libbpf bootstrap, I believe, is what you're referring to, right? And one of the examples already uses BlazeSim, yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, so we have like an example in libbpf bootstrap, but we also have like one of the tools, I don't remember which one, it's like trace or some 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 of the tools in BCC itself, but like libbpf based tools that uh, is using Red Snoop. It's it's working with user space stack traces, so that's not not trivial to implement like with a custom code. So. Mm -hmm. uh, but if I may to engage the other part of the room, uh, what does the ISO island do like in Tetragon, like, do you capture stack traces? What do you use to symbolize? KL sims. But that's only kernel stack traces. You don't capture user space. We don't symbolize users for now. Yeah, but um, since we are a Go program, it's really difficult. Like, and so we are a Go program, and we also don't want to have C Go. So we've tried to remove all of the dependencies from libbpf, for example, just so that we can be a pure Go library and using the Cilium libbpf library. So um, it would be great to have something like that, but unfortunately, I'm not sure how it would exactly work for like a Go language. Maybe we can sell out. Um, but that's not something that we like to do in general. <laughs> I don't think we have any plans currently to write Go bindings, but it is a possibility. I so the, we could. Um, we could. The, the thing about, I'm not sure if it's even possible to write Go bindings just because, like, uh, I don't know, like, probably 
you would need to use the C bindings as the FFI for for the Go. So, like, if you have the C bindings, it's easy to use that. But it means right. that we will have to like go back on our initial idea to be pure Go. Uh, right. Which, yeah. Maybe I I don't fully understand, but it, could we would it be an easier task to build Go bind Go code? Um, to talk to that fast server? Is that what you're suggesting? Like in our Golang side, we'll just, we, somebody else will be running the server and we'll just have the API um, in Go. Like, that slow, basically, we're not a slow device, but <laughs> we basically are the slow device in this context, right? I, th I think that would be okay. Maybe? Right, but in your case, so y you would still be running you would still want to run um, Go on the slow device? Yes, not? yeah. I mean, the slow device would basically be uh, would be Tetragon in our case. So yeah. we'd be running, collecting stack traces, and then if we needed to s s ship them to the fast server? Yeah, so I think the, the point to take away there is that you would basically be on the hook for providing these normalized addresses to the fast server, as I dubbed it, um, which already is a little bit of logic, but it's obviously not the entire core of the symbolization. And is there an arrow going back to the slow device? Like, can we get things out of the fast server? Like, we, we might want to query the data or something. Uh, so this is just a schematic, right? Um, Blaze sim itself would merely run here, and it would run here. This entire transfer of information is basically not taken care of by the library at all. Um, we would provide the data. Uh, we assume it can be transported by, transported by whatever means, and so you could also go the other direction, obviously. So, so yeah. So this slow, fast, right? Like this remote symbolization scenario is not necessarily what you need, right? Like, so we need it for like a weak device where we do not want to do symbolization, right? Like, and also, actually, we use this architecture in our production, like fleet-wide system, because we don't want to like disrupt the workloads, right? So like we try to do minimal amount of uh, work to, to capture data and maybe some additional metadata, and then like do heavyweight symbolization later on like dedicated fleet of hosts, right? But in your case, if you don't like need to care about this and you just want to like capture stack trace and do symbolization on the same host, then like you can combine those two in a remote set, like remote relative to your Go process, right? And then just do RPC within the local host. And then like as long as the, the server is like C Rust based, then like it will be easy to consume this uh, Blaze Sim library. But then from Go side, you just do gRPC and like send send raw raw like addresses and like get back information. That's it. Like, I, I think in that model, like, I don't care what the fast server is doing, right? It, it's its own thing. I'm just talking to it over, like, a Unix domain socket or something. Um, so it could probably be Rust. I'm not sure that that would be a problem. Yeah. Yeah, so I think that's what Andrew was getting at. This separation of concerns may not be relevant for you. You may be able to just do the entire symbolization on the device, because you mentioned it's not a slow device itself. And then you just do, like you spin up a gRPC server or whatever, and you just talk to that to get the result of the symbolization. Just maybe to, like, to make it a little bit easier for, for people to understand. So like what you input into slow device, basically. like it, Think about BPF, right? Because like this is designed for BPF use case. You get BPF gets stuck, right? You get array of raw addresses, and like you know that it's coming from some PID, from some process, right? What slow device is doing, it takes this array and PID, goes into maps, finds like elf, elf files, and then normalizes the address. Like it, it removes like the the absolute address at which the process was loaded, and, and translates that into like file of set, I think, or maybe virtual address of set. It doesn't matter, right? But like it does all of that and nothing more. So on on the output, you just have build ID, maybe passed to the uh, to the binary, and like those normalized addresses. It's still not not human readable yet, right? But it's enough to actually do like a heavyweight post processing using dwarf 
potentially later on. So that's the split between the slow and fast, so like local and remote. In typical use cases, right, like the BCC tools, they don't care about this. They capture stack trace, they do this kind of like normalization and dwarf-based or elf-based processing on the host, right? So like you can combine those two. And that's like what typically is done. So this is kind of advanced scenario. In your use case, it will depend on like how, how fancy you want to be, basically. Do you want to split or not? But in either case, you will need to hide this behind the RPC. My, my, my only comment to that was that once you have a gRPC, it doesn't matter if it's local or remote, it'll be Unix domain socket or it'll be wrapped in HTTP or something. So, yeah, it's, oh. um, so I have a question. At, at what point, because you, I mean you need the dwarf, right, and you need the elf. Uh, at what point you get these? Like, is it in a previous point in time? So, like, I would like if if you are, for example, on Kubernetes, and then a container starts, I would have to like orchestrate the container system to pass you like the container image so that you can get the binaries. Like, how would you do this in a cloud scenario, like a Kubernetes scenario? <coughs> you mean how the symbolization would work in a in a cloud scenario? So, so I guess. There are two parts of this, right? One is getting the elf and the dwarf image to the fast server. Oh, so you're talking about the remote symbolization specifically. Maybe I shouldn't even have put up this example. Uh, it's a rather a advanced use case. In a, in a general um, setting, you would assume that you would have the debug information available locally somewhere. And you can configure Blaze Sim to know about what this somewhere is. So you would, for instance, provide your path to, I don't know, user lib debug, and it would look up, you know, your dwarf debug information below there. And in the remote symbolization case, um, basically this logic would reside in the server, obviously, and it would. The assumption here is that this dwarf debug information and the path to it could be inferred based on this metadata, the path either to the binary or let's say the build ID. And based on that, you could perform the symbolization itself. Does this answer your question? Yeah, I think so. So I think like if you're running on a container system, like at some point when the container like starts, you would have to pass this information into the ser like the dwarf information into the, the server so that you can, so I can get like the symbolization later whenever I need it, right? Y you want to perform the symbolization in the container, is that correct? Y so or you want I to do it outside? I so like in, in Tetragon, for example, we monitor uh, containers running in the system. Right. And at, at some point we'll get a stack trace. Right. Um, so for this to work, you would have to know the debug information for the binary inside the container, right? Uh, no, you would not necessarily have to. That's basically where um, you could do only the capturing of addresses in the container. Then you would, along with this capturing of addresses, you would normalize the addresses as I explained, and then you would capture the path slash build ID to the binary. And if you can make sense of this information outside of the container, then you're all golden and you can still do the, perf the sorry, the symbolization outside of the container itself. Uh, let, let's take it offline. <laughs> okay. So build ID is supposed to be unique ID, right? And like given build ID, you should be able to even fetch the, like the original dwarf and like elf file from some other system, right? So like in, in production, we actually have like a, some sort of cache where we, if we have build ID, we can just say like, give me the, the original uh, package and then like we, right. we unpack so you it. Have a service, right? So you have some sort of service where you give the build ID and then, right? So I don't know if that thing exists in. So that thing in open source is debugging for D, as far as I understand. It's like it's a service, it's RPC protocol where you can say like, give me binary for this build ID. I mean, hand wavy, I, I actually don't know, but that, that's how it's supposed to work. 
Thank you. All right. Thank you very much.